Namaste. Welcome to part two of psychoanalysis, the other, the deeper processes with our subject expert, Dr. Himan Shavet. Namaste, sir. Namaste. So, so far we have been discussing about the background of the concept of the other. We were somewhere in our first episode part, we were uh, discussing about the phenomena of early life around the, uh, the aspect of the other from the standpoint of the pathology and where we where we discussed about oceanic fusion, positive, negative, the merger, the disintegration, the self-annihilation, fusion, self-transitives. What more do you see there? Um, just to close this answer, I would make a comment that we look at certain phenomena which are unpleasant and distressing to the patient. The phenomena of merger, of self-annihilation, of fragmentary fear, of fragility, of regression to the state of primary narcissism in a schizophrenic process, of anxiety, of disintegration of the self. So these are or the anxiety related to the loss of the other, or the swallowing by the other, or merging into the other, or the attack by the other. So these are like issues which are related to the difficulties of the other, the difficulties of the self, or difficulties of the two. This one part of mm. events which lead to pathology, at the root these are there. But there is another part which I said, which is the pleasant part. The pleasant part involves the fusion. Often there can be an ecstatic fusion. And then this difficulty of breaking from this fusion. And that is where the dependence difficulty comes in that the fusion at its unconscious roots is ecstatic. It is all uh, providing. And therefore, the attachment is so strong that the all providing thing cannot be given. It's almost like a fusion in the, at the unconscious level with something which completes you, almost something omnipotent. If not omnipotent, something like omnipotent. And therefore, it's very difficult for the dependent to break free from this unconscious ecstasy, this unconscious completion, this unconscious getting everything from that fusion. And you have the similar fusion when you talk about the narcissist and the dependent. So there the fusion is ecstatic to both. The dependent wants to give up the sense of I to the other <clears throat> and the other is more than eager to appropriate the sense of the I of the other and make him an extension of his own. So these are some of the deeper processes and states involving the I and the other which are often at the root of pathology both neurotic and psychotic. That also gives me an idea like sometimes in uh, certain cases, there is immense of fear projected on the therapist and many of the patients eject out of the therapy with the fear of being swallowed by the big eye, the but significant one. Similarly, let us say there is a sadistic narcissist patient and a dependent mm. child. And the dependent child obviously is traumatized by the sadistic narcissist patient. Even if the child is not dependent, the child will get trained into dependence by the sheer mm. power of the sadistic narcissist person. Mm. Now, the uh, child comes to therapy and as the closeness with the therapist develops, the person is terrified. The person is terrified of a second fusion 
a second mm. fusion because the person has never had close relationships which were not fusion. Because closeness is a slippery slope to fusion. And we have to hold ourselves in closeness not to get into fusion. Otherwise, it's a slippery slope. And the man is terrified of this slippery slope. If the ego strength is not there, you can slide. If the self-regulation is not there, you can slide. So he is developing closeness with the therapist. And as the closeness approaches a limit, the man is terrified or the woman is terrified, whoever it is. The patient is terrified of further closeness because that to the unconscious of that person means a second fusion, a second terrifying torture. Like the first with the mother. And unless this is interpreted, the person doesn't become aware of it. It's only when you interpret and the person loosens himself a bit and allows a slightly more closeness that further work can happen. But we also have to be careful that we have our clutches and brakes and the person also has his clutches and brakes. Because the unconscious habit of the person is fusion. No boundaries. And the person therefore can seduce, entice, compel the therapist also into a fusion. So, also you can also be... yeah, please go on. I, I was just coming in touch with this that uh, that is the reason why at times uh, there are a lot of uh, initial sessions with such clients, they are silent, they are not opening up, but they don't give up the therapy either. Yeah. There's another category also. They keep showing up till uh, they're testing the waters, till till they develop the, the, they feel this containment is strong enough to hold them from this point of view, the other point of view. Correct. So they are testing out the waters of confidentiality, of trust, of safety. Of unconscious parameters mostly in this correct case, but even as even as the linguistic work is not being done, the non-verbal part is definitely happening. That's why they are coming. Transference plays a very significant role there. Yeah, correct. There are two parts which are very significant in the non-verbal part: the handling of the transference and projective identity. Many it's times like, it is just pure luck. I mean, you just don't yeah. have it conscious, it just gets handled by its own. Right. Some some bigger phenomena of unconscious take over. Yeah. I think that that is a time we have to hold on to the interpretations being opened up to the client because it can be terrifying for them. So too early an interpretation might Correct. Make them avoid it. Correct. And they give you hints so, that they are not ready for interpretation. Yes. Unconsciously, they give you hints that they are not yet ready for interpretation. So this is a question of we have to hold our horses. And trust the process. Trust the process. Uh, so, so can we go deeper into the fusion since we find it often involved in psychosis and personality disorders mostly? Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the philosophers, Martin Buber, he used to have a favorite statement of his. And he used to say that the ideal is Two human beings should be have, should be relating to each other in the format of I thou. But the reality is that we relate to each other in the format of I it. Where it is reducing somebody to something to be used. Something to be dominated. Something dehumanized. And the whole journey is from I it to I thou both for the individual and for the society. Now, this is a very ideal form of relating, either. 
I it might be another extreme, but the more common is turbulent IU. Mm. The ordinary IU, which is both turbulent and peaceful, at times peaceful, at times turbulent. But the pathological component of this, pathological uh, rendition of this is turbulent relating. The I and the U, there is turbulent relating. Mm -hmm. And this turbulent relating we find very pervasively in personality disorders. That the I is not healthy enough. The U often is chosen unconsciously not to be healthy enough. Mm. Even if the U is healthy enough, the processing of I is not healthy to see the healthy as U. Mm. And therefore, the events between the two are turbulent. Now, coming to the processes, what happened in uh, personality disorders and uh, psychosis, the core okay. processes are this. One is the process of fusion. Mm. Fusing with the other. And this is both ecstatic and terrifying. And this is where at the core we see difficulties of dependence, which is seen not only in dependent personality disorders, but as you said before, most personality disorders are mixed. Mm. Therefore, there's always a dependent component. And when that component is involved in this ecstatic fusion, the break from the uh, pathological other who is causing the trouble does not happen. That the person keeps talking about the trauma, the traumatizing other, the attacking other, mm -hmm. but the person does not take any measures to be free from that. So it's like an actionless complaining. Mm -hmm. There is no will to heal. And this is surrender part, and acceptance. Yeah. So the, this part is resignation and disappointment. Part is helplessness. Part is training and habit, but another part is fusion. Oh. That the person always had such pathological people around him since childhood. And unconsciously, the person used to fuse with those pathological people and uh. ecstatic about mm. the unconscious, and that continues. Mm. So the pathological father is substituted by the pathological lover or the pathological husband or the pathological boss. Mm. or the pathological elder brother. So consciously there is suffering and unconsciously there is fusion and ecstasy. And part of the problem is reality conditions, but part of the problem is this. That the attachment dynamics which are largely unconditional, they and partly the fusion does not allow the will to heal to really emerge and consolidate. So there is no action and only complaining. Repeated complaining. Mm. No action. So this is one dynamic at the personality disorder part. Fusion can also play a part in a very psychotic way where there is a fear of merger and a fear of breaking free which often results in bizarre behavior. Like at an instant, somebody sitting with you and suddenly the person runs. Mm. And there can be many reasons why it happens. One of the reasons can be this, that somehow the urge to merge, the fusion, the fragmentation anxiety has activated. And the only way the person can handle is it to be away from the person towards whom that impulses. There is the problem of fragile self, which we find in personality disorders and psychosis both. That the self disintegrates because I and not I, that clear distinction has not been consolidated. The I is not strong enough. And there is a fear of the invasion of not I, the attack of not I. Then there is a problem of separation. 
a step lower than before, usual? Before, before we go to the separation, I have a question here. While we're talking about the personality disorders, for example, there's a narcissist uh, dealing with a dependent personality. Uh, there, the act of fusion is fantasy fulfillment for both, right? While a narcissist uh, coming in touch with a regular person with or a stronger than that narcissist person, can that narcissism uh, creating a fear of being swallowed by the object, the other, converts into the uh, annihilation of the other by an attack? Yeah. Is that is that how the narcissist would play out? Yeah, many times it would play out in that way. That the the narcissistic uh, uh, version itself is very attacking and very controlling and very you know dominating. But if we see from this point of view, what we're discussing right now, is it that there is so much of fear of being engulfed, so there is a need to kill that other or be little or minimize that other, which becomes kind of annihilation of the other. Correct. So if the narcissist has a psychopathic traits mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some order of ego strength and this dynamics play out, then the violence on the other can be a defense against being engulfed. Mm -hmm. It can be a defense against merger. Unconscious. Unconscious. Okay. Because uh, the narcissist actually operates at two different levels. Like the, the neurotic narcissist and the psychotic narcissist? The neurotic narcissist. The neurotic. The neurotic narcissist operates at two levels. One is he wants a reverse fusion. Somebody to fuse it to him. <laughs> which is the dependent. The dependent right. story is very clear. He wants to fuse back. Right, right. Because he is the opposite end of omnipotence in his own unconscious mind. On a 10 point scale, he is zero and he wants to fuse back to 10. Because of the split, he has de idealized himself completely, idealized somebody else completely. And now he wants to fuse back with that idealized person. So the dependent story is very clear. Open the split, project out all the goodness, then merge with that goodness. And be ecstatic in that fusion. Be safe and protected in that fusion. Be competent in that fusion. That story is very clear. The story of the narcissist mm. is slightly complicated. At a mm. more upper type, more higher levels, he wants a reverse. Most he wants a reverse fusion, but at a deeper level, he wants to fuse. Yeah, there's a need of fusion. There's a but need of fusion. Importance. Yeah, so there is some sort of dependence even in the narcissist at a very deep level. Right, right. So he also wants to fuse back into the omnipotent. Now, usually, this desire is held in check very strongly, very comfortably by the ego. And it appears as though the two are independent. But if the ego is not strong enough, and if these two desires come very close to each other, then you can have a reverse fusion as a defense against the primary desire of fusion. Otherwise, the two can operate independently. The unconscious thing does not bear upon the conscious thing. The two appear almost independent. But if they come close together, either because of lack of ego strength or whatever other reason, there may be other reasons, then there is a desire to merge back. And often this happens when the narcissist's ego is broken, the ego strength is disintegrated. And often this happens in midlife. 
the desire to merge back into somebody omnipotent, exactly like a dependent, comes up in a narcissist. And often, these unconscious things come up in the dreams of a narcissist. Mm. If you analyze the dreams of a narcissist till almost 18, 20 years of age, you will see huge amount of dependence there. In the sense of the ideal, in the sense of merging with the omnipotent or making somebody omnipotent and merging him back into him. That dynamic is there. So in the dreams, you will see the omnipotent narcissist as 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 well. Somebody else also deposited with quite some amount of omnipotence, and that person fusing with the narcissist. Mm -hmm. So this is one element of it. Then the whole spectrum of the fragile self. When the early life other was not good enough or not available enough, the fragile self is created and the fragile self then relates to the other in very dysfunctional ways. And in therapy, the fragile self, we know how difficult it is. Mm. So that is one very important element of pathology. The fragile self created because of the not good enough other. Then there is a very important element of identifying with the deadness. That the other presented to the person after I and the other are clearly demarcated, the other is a depressed other, a dead other. But the need for attachment is so strong and so unconditional that no matter what we get, we get attached. So if we are presented with only one object of attachment which is dead, we attach to it and internalize that. And then it's a paradox because the attachment with it means we should be depressed with it. Because if we remain happy, it's a betrayal of the one you are attached to. So guilt comes up because you are attached to somebody who is perpetually dead. So there is no way you can be alive. Your being alive is betraying that attachment. So if you want to be happy, you have to give up that attachment which cannot be done. It's too painful. So you are caught in a paradox. You say, we are fused together. It's only you and me and nobody else is required in this world. It's only you and me and we complete each other. But we complete each other only in our sadness. So then there is a sad fusion with the internalized dead mother, which often happens that the person wants to be alive, but something does not allow him to be. It almost appears guilt to be alive. To be alive and happy almost appears guiltful. And this internalized dead mother can be at the root of many problems that we see. The dead other early in life. One element is the intensity. Healthy relating and fusion have a difference. In fusion, that is... Previous, I'm still with the previous point when you're talking about this identification of de deadness. Is it Thanos at play? It can be. It can be. Like... If somebody has at that level a choice, Thanatos can be a blame. Or the mother is not completely dead but is interpreted as such. Thanatos is at blame. Otherwise, if the mother is really, really in major depression, hmm. then it's reality. It's not Thanatos. It is what is actually outside goes inside. Right. It's not contribution from the death instinct from inside. It's just the outside as it is goes in. Mm -mm -mm. But yes, 
in some situations you can have contribution from inside where the outside is on just that side of the border or just this side of the border is pulled completely in and seen as very dead, far more dead than the person actually is. Actually, I mean, dead not in the sense of the literal dead, in the sense mm -hmm. of depressed. Mm -hmm. Non-aligned, let us say that. I was coming to fusion. It's very important because mm -hmm. one of the difficulties in therapy of getting somebody out of a fusion difficulty is this. The fusion has intensity and authenticity in terms of the ecstasy and safety, uh, the openness, which a normal right. relating does not have. So we are asking him to give up a box of chocolate for a couple of chocolates we have to give him. And that from a cost benefit analysis point of view is a loss making business in terms of pleasure. And that's very hard for most people to give up. The same is true for regression to primary narcissism. Hmm. Asking him to embrace reality, which is quite painful and frustrating in exchange for that omnipotent ecstatic bliss and this is a deal he won't get it. And therefore the difficulty is in both cases very difficult, very real in the therapy process. And in case of regression to primary narcissism is mostly a lost pattern. Therapy can't win against that. Very rarely somebody would win against. But in fusion over a period of time we can make the person slowly give up certain things. But the core always remains, it's very difficult to give it up completely. The more practical part is the person can find a healthy substitute or a less difficult substitute. Mm. Mm. And then we also have a situation of a semi-fusion attachment intensity. Which is where most of our work actually happens. That there is a semi-fusion condition of attachment to a dysfunctional figure and the person comes to us. And then over a period of time we can look at very common in personality disorders, very common in depression, very common also in uh, addictions. Mm. One of the shoots of uh, the dead mother identification can also go into a sexuality or isolation of affect, that also can be. There is also this, uh, in histrionicity we see this, the desire for ecstatic fusion. Hmm. In uh, dependence we see that completely out towards one person. But in histrionicity, we see that desire rising and giving up, rising and giving up. The search of the omnipotent, the search of attention, the search of validation, and once it happens, giving it up and starting it again. Okay. The uh, healthy equivalent of fusion is participation mystique, what Bolby used to refer to where there is a conscious healthy fusion and a conscious healthy entry and exit out of that fusion without any pathological outcomes of the other. Mm -mm. So these are some of the issues that we see in uh, especially in psychosis and personality disorders. Issues of the other and of I as it has become because of the other. So, till now we are seeing from the point of view of I, how about the lost other? Uh, loss is a quite a big area in psychopathology. And as we said before, 
there are two kinds of losses. One that you distinctly remember and one that you have no memory of. So there is a lost, lost other. And there is a remembered lost other. And in the remembered lost other, you can still fantasize, you can still have memories of. You can still have dreams, may not be real, but they satisfy you in some way and make up for the lost other. But in the lost, lost other, it's very difficult because you don't realize what the loss is, but you only feel its after effects. It's almost as though the loss is covered, saved by some refractory gap in memory. Something which will not just connect to language, to conscious movement inside the mind. And so can it be that whenever there is an uh, unconscious, repressed, pre-linguistic lost, um, every time an individual have a, a merger or a fusion opportunity, they project that lost loss and creates the loss in the present. Yeah, that can be one way of giving a name to the nameless. And then, then again, doing something to lose it because that is how they they have been attached to that lost in their unconscious. Doing things so that they lose it eventually. So the whole challenge is to free that attachment and the pent up feelings related to that early loss, which are not in connection in any way to our conscious efforts or language. So, if the person is lucky and that part, the healthy part of the person recreates something linked to it and through that linked phenomena or situation, we can hold the chain and reach to the end. That can be one way of bringing that unknowable into the realm of the knowable. And That's then, the, sorry? That where the healing would take place, healing would occur. Correct. And in such situations when these things don't work in our system, it is worthwhile to try other system of pranic healing and holistic healing approaches. Okay. Because if the verbal highway is not open to us, then in the realm of the non-verbal, the holistic healing techniques also are welcome which are largely non-verbal. Mm. Um, the third part is about the lost other with whom there was a narcissistic part fusion. Okay. And this is Freud's etiology for depression. Okay. That there is a loss of a narcissistically cathected object. And therefore, such a loss cannot be replaced or mourned completely. So the only way is to make that a part of our own, so as to deny that loss. And when you make that a part of your own, then all the feelings towards it also now are turned against yourself. And therefore, the anger towards the person lost is now towards yourself. And that anger towards oneself gets into depression. So this is the Freud's recipe for explaining depression. Now there are two more parts. There are some cases where the loss of the other is a special other. He was the only good person in life. So the loss of the only good other and worse than that, loss of the only other. So, you can have the loss of the complementing other. Loss of the only good other and loss of the only other. And the last is the worst. Loss of the competent other can bring down something in the professional realm. 
loss of the only good other can take you into depression, despondency, cynicism, pessimism. But the loss of the only other is a recipe for disintegration, for loneliness, for anxiety, for fragmentation. Takes you into a state where you say, what is left after the last pope has left? Is in that state. You have only one hope and that hope is no more there. The last hope is extinguished. What is left after the last hope is left? That state you get into when you lose the only other. That in your life you have the only other and that is lost. You get into that extinguishing of the last flame situation. So these are the various types of the lost other and dynamics flow out of it. Symptoms of depression, of anxiety, of narcissism, of addiction, of dysfunctional relating patterns, all of that flow out of this losses of different types of the other. In many cases, if it happens in an advanced age, the loss of the only other, for the rest of the life, in many cases, the there is no coming out of that existential loneliness and suffering. That also happens in many cases. It's a it's like it's a life that therapy can't be. So, in such cases where there is no good other in the past, present, or future, is life worth it? If spiritual aspect is active in the person's life, yes, it is worth it. Because then we are looking at freedom from the other and the search of ecstasy and bliss. But if the spiritual part is not active and there is no healing inside, it is not worth it. And there I believe right to death should be a fundamental right in that context. Because there is a if, psychological death? Yes. And the I left just by itself? And you are living a suffering. For the rest of your life, you are not living a life, you are living suffering. And in many cases, it's unbearable where the person should be allowed to go in a productive way. Maybe his organs can be donated. You can have a law of that type. It does not have to be a dysfunctional, eruptive, disruptive, psychotic or neurotic death. It can be a productive death, peaceful, graceful death. In some cases, 